11. Morning, everybody. Miigwech JT for that song. Uh, it's been a lot of years since 1901 since we were able to occupy this space here in Berrien Springs. Uh, we don't get out here very often, and so it's really wonderful to be able to hear those songs and, and our ways over here in these parts. Minowaban, Gishap Gishik and Deshnikas, Bodwa Wadami and Dao, Pakaganik and Debendagwis, Mishiki and Dodiam, Dwajak and Dochbia, Morsa Augusta and Debenda Mazodanen. Good morning. I said that my name is Madeline Big Bear, that I am a Potawatomi woman, that I am a member of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomis, that my family are the Morsals and the Augustas. And, oh, and that I come from Dwajek. I was born here in our homeland uh, in the hospital that my people far predate, so the hospital that we've been being born in since we've been being born in hospitals. What I really said in my language when I said that I was a member of the Pokagon Band was I said that the Pokagon Band holds my papers. Because in this country, we have to prove that we're Native American to be able to retain our indigenous rights in this country. And we do that by being federally enrolled in tribes, the BIA recognizes 573, any day it could be two or one or two more, so between 573 and 575 federally recognized tribes. Those tribes are who declare to the United States who is and isn't Indian within their community. And so the Pokagon Band of Potawatomis are the ones who declare to the United States that I am indeed Indian and I am part of their tribe. So the Pokagon Band holds my papers, is what I said to you. Mishiganik Nishinaabek, past, present, and future history. That's what we're gonna talk about today. We don't have a long time to talk about it. And I'm gonna to talk to you as if you um, have a, a basic fundamental level of understanding of Nishinaabek Indian people in America. The map that I have up there is translated by one of our knowledge keepers in our community into Potawatomi. And those are, if you can see them, some of the original words for our people. Oh, I'm assuming this is why we're here this month, because we're Indian 12 months out of the year, but we only get all these phone calls in November. So we're glad that you were on the list of people who called and asked us to come out to at least um, understand and share some knowledge in, in this month that we're all trying to be conscientious. And we're survivors of genocide and ethnic elimination. Since the arrival of Europeans, we're the original stewards of the territory that we're in right now, of the territory that Andrews University is on, Berrien Springs. This is within the sole territory of the Potawatomi people, of the Bodwawadmik. We're stewards of this land since Creator sent us here and we'll be the stewards of this land until Creator tells us otherwise. Pokagonic. I may say that word, and that is our word for the Pokagon people. Pokagon man, I want to meet people. Uh, that's a little bit about me. And that's a translation of the things that I already translated for you this morning. And here we go. So we're gonna start with a little bit of our Anishinaabek. Anishinaabek is the word um, that we use for ourselves when we refer to Indian people. So our history is an oral history and you guys at least have an understanding of that. If you don't know how that works, that's okay. Um, what I've done today is I've taken our oral history and I am only presenting you things that you can Google because I know that in your society, you have to be able to read and you have to be able to quantify these things. So about everything that you're gonna to hear today is quantifiable pretty easily on the internet and there's some links that we have to share with you guys. We've been here for thousands of years. Our history far predates initial contact. I'm gonna to talk to you about our historical timeline because our timeline exists separate of an American timeline. These are stories that we'll be telling in a thousand years about what was going on in this land today in this time. So our history runs concurrent. Our existence runs concurrent 
with American history and American existence. While we still have that American load to bear, we also are our own completely individual, different tribal people with our own set of beliefs and our own set of culture and our own culture. Um, Andrews University was established at a time in Battle Creek, because y'all were Battle Creek College first in 1874. The Morrell Act was being passed in 1874, the first one. And that act was taking our land specifically for the purposes of land-grant universities. That's one of the things that Abraham Lincoln was responsible for. So your first university in Battle Creek falls into that timeline. The Morrell Act was the second act when you moved here. Abraham Lincoln passed that second Morrell Act. When you moved here and became Andrews University, um, that also falls into that timeline of our lands being taken for the purposes of land grant universities. So about that time, we had already been removed. We were removed in 1838. We're going to hear a little bit about that in this presentation. And you were 60 years. We were 60 years removed. That was two generations at least removed when the college here was established. So we were, we were pretty well cleared out of the area. In 1492, the populations, so this is uh, just survivors of genocide, uh, but active genocide. We look at examples all, all day. We see examples and are able to point them out. In 1492, the estimated population of the Americas was estimated to be as high as a third of the world's population, just that number is astounding. That in 1492, North and South America had a third of the Earth's population. That comes from a movie, a documentary, called The Canary Effect. The Canary Effect, yeah. Um, then that's a university documentary too, but just that one piece of information, uh, that's a well of information, that movie. Now, Indian nations are divided by their languages. So I say in Den Wamaganek when I'm referring to my family. What I'm really saying is people who don't all talk the same. There's over 500, like I said, 573, estimated 575 tribes. They're all divided by their languages. Um, and Potawatomi is the language that we speak. Now, indigenous people of North America, this is important in conversation to understand. I wake up every morning and I fight the American government for survival. I fight the American government that there is still a place for my people and my grandkids' kids to be Pokagon Potawatomi every day. We wake up and we fight the American government for those rights. So we're separated. Indigenous people of the Americas are separated into, into different categories. First Nations people are from Canada. They refer to themselves as First Nations. And they have their own system of oppression. When I was young, they were shooting up school buses in Canada of First Nations kids who were battling over their land rights. And the United States here, where American Indians are Native American, indigenous Mexican people would be Mexican American, Central American, further down, South American Indians. So we're known as Native Americans and American Indians. But that First Nations, you'll hear us, we're a border state. So you'll hear uh, a lot, uh, us referred to as First Nations. You know, we refer to other people as Native American. And, and the term native is just a term that gets used a lot now. That's pretty interchangeable. It's pretty inoffensive, because uh, there's a lot of conversations in the world about derogatory terms and representation. Potawatomi is the English word for our people, Bodwabadmi. And what that means is that we are responsible, we're keepers of the fire. And we're not just keepers of literal fire, but we are, because that fire is sacred to us in our language. Things are animate or they're inanimate. Our language is very different. In our language, that fire is animate, and that's one of those grandfather spirits that we take care of and we are keepers of that fire. But you can't have people, you can't have a tribe, you can't have a nation, you can't exist without fire. And our people fought a lot of battles 
to be in the places that Potawatomi people are. If you look at a map, Potawatomi people are all over the waterways and maintaining waterways. So you'll hear this term, Three Fires Confederacy, referring to Michigan, Michigan Anishinaabek. And that word, Michigan, means clear cut. So that was the word when um, we started naming states and areas and places like that. Michigan was clear cut. Michigan. These three tribes Ottawa is the English word for the Wadawa, Chippewa is the English word for the Ojibwe people, and then Bodwabadme people. So our people all lived here in Michigan, and we weren't the only ones who lived here in Michigan. There were the Muscoutin people, there were the Wyandotte people, there were the Huron people. Before that, there were Footprints of Sioux people. All of these people have been removed. Anywhere people live in the United States, Indian people have been removed from. So when you come to Michigan and you need to make treaties, it's impossible to be able to communicate with all these different tribes in Michigan. So you take the strongest, three tribes that you can communicate with, and you ask them to enter into treaties under a confederacy. And so these were our good relations that then became known as the Three Fires Confederacy. The Three Fires Confederacy, though, is an English term for an entity that was created to be able to sign treaties without all the individual treaty signers from each individual tribes. Oh, the Ojibwe people are keepers of religion. They are very different people. I know an Ojibwe person when I, when I interact with them. You may know people of other religions when you interact with them, right? You can tell. You know these Ojibwe people. They like walk around in sacredness. They walk around and that is their intention in life, is to keep that religion, the Odawa people, to keep that trade going. And then us keeping everyone safe. And then this is the teaching that we have before we start school. We go to kindergarten loaded up with a whole lot of indigenous knowledge, of Indian information. Before colonizers came here, we didn't have war and we didn't have diseases. And that's inarguable. Because at some point, everyone didn't have war and diseases. It was just a lot longer for us because we had everything that we needed here. There was nothing to fight over. First contact didn't just happen in Jamestown. First contact happened a thousand different times with a thousand different nations. Here in this area, it happened in the early 1600s. When I say this area, I mean Michigan. It wasn't until the 1700s, until this area, this St. Joe River area, started getting, started contact, had their initial contact and started getting traveled. Now, at that point, we were called the St. Joseph River Band of Potawatomi Indians. And that's what we were for a long time. So like I said, if you look at a, a map, you'll see Odawa tribes, those traders, on waterways that have trap lines. You'll see Potawatomi people on big waterways. And now, camps used to move around, tribes, when I say a footprint, all the tribes used the waterways, all the tribes needed access to the waterways, and our greater tribes managed the areas for those smaller camps. And those camps would even fluctuate depending on their leadership. Sometimes uh, just the camp numbers themselves would fluctuate depending on how their intention and what they had to be doing. So our people have used these waterways and these trails we, I tell a story, when it snows, we tell a story about the animal paths and how we, are, we followed the animal paths. We didn't make our own paths. We followed those animal paths. Well, those paths turned into roads, turned into streets, turned into highways. And if you were to do, again, any Googling, you could Google maps of Indian paths 
from the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. Then you can start Googling maps of roadways, highways. You can interlay those maps. And those roadways and those highways follow all of our original paths, which follow all those original animal paths. The same goes for the waterways. If you look at the waterway travel, as far back as the earliest maps that you can find, there's still the waterway traveling that's done today when it comes to um, trading. Let's talk about traders real quick. So when you think about traders, you, uh, you get a picture of a trader dressed really impressively next to like a big pile of pelts because they traded these pelts back with their benefactors and they didn't have these big beavers, great fur, and they didn't have these big otters in, uh, in their inland seaways like we had them. At contact, the waters were all polluted over in Europe and Asia. Those waterways were already completely polluted and undrinkable. They didn't understand the concept of having fresh waterways and using fresh waterways. So these traders, they had to make agreements with us. They wouldn't have known where to find animals. They wouldn't have known how to trap these animals. They would have had to gone all the way back to their continent to get the materials to come back to trap these animals. And so they had to make relationships with us. And one of the things that we have that to, to this day that we still have are trap lines. And those are territories along those waterways that different families are responsible for. Different tribes, different people within those families, whatever those families' responsibilities are. So these traders had to have well-established relationships with us to be able to trade us for material and ribbons, wools. They didn't have much that we needed in the very beginning. For these furs, trap lines are still around today. And it became practice to marry in to an Indian tribe to get the rights of those trap lines, to get the knowledge of those trap lines, and to get the network from marrying into an Indian woman. And so you can also research all sorts of traders who most of the ones you search are going to be married to an Indian woman. And even in our families, that story is in my family. My family goes far enough back to that exact thing. Um, early encounters. So that talks about the Indian Wars started in about 17, okay. In the 1600s, um, in 1790, okay, so we get to 1790, we're still not removed yet. George Washington does the Trade Act, the Intercourse Trade Act. And that's where the, this is where the term half-breed comes from. And that's the only reason I mention this. We actually fought battles with George Washington, St. Joe River Band of Potawatomi people, with George Washington and those troops. So this act meant that well, you can't be taking advantage of these Indians anymore. They have to have some white blood in them. Otherwise, it's just taking advantage of them and they, with the, uh, everything we're doing could be overturned, right? So that's what the Trade Act was and that's where the term half-breed comes from. All right, throughout the 1800s is where we really get into America having strength in Indian removal in 1830 was when Andrew Jackson enacted the Indian Removal Act. Now, in Michigan, there's an Indian removal line. It goes about halfway down in Michigan. Everyone below that line was removed. Any Indians who were below this Indian removal line had to go. And so that would have been our Potawatomi tribes. We could either move north of that removal line or we had to go out west west of the Mississippi. Our Potawatomi removal is known as the Trail of Death. That happened in 1838, so on September 4th in 1838, we were voluntarily rounded up by gunpoint in our camps 
and marched for 60 days. We walked for 60 days to St. Mary's, Kansas. We got there on November 4th. Today is November 10th. We would have had our fifth full night of rest from walking for 60 days today. That happened in 1838. Uh, so the, treaty, the first Treaty of Chicago was signed in the 18-teens by Chief Mateo. Chief Mateo was about 24 years old, got killed mysteriously. That didn't stop us because along came Leopold Pokagan. Leopold had knowledge and understanding of what was happening with land removal, what was happening with Indian removal, and how to navigate that. And so the second Treaty of Chicago, Leopold Pokagan signed. And that was the first treaty that actually granted us land base in, along the Calumet Trail in Indiana and here at home. The second Treaty of Chicago was in 1832, I believe. Leopold also signed that second Treaty of Chicago. So, as far as Potawatomi removal goes, we either went north of the removal line, and by the way, the removal line was a swath of where fertile agricultural land started. So we either went north into Hanneville, which is still um, a thriving community today, and they are the Wigwas ZB, Hannibal community. We are the St. Joe River people, Pokagan Band, Pokaganik. The Nottawasepi is the Huron Band. The Nottawasepi are the only tribe in Michigan below the, re the removal line who retained reservation land. So their territory right now is original reservation land and falls under the, falls under the laws of a reservation. Machipanashiwish, which is a gun lake band. Machipanashiwish was a leader. He fought with Tecumseh. Our troops were severely depleted. Our people were depleted when they brought us an adoption ceremony to be able to strengthen our people back up. So those are the ones who are still here in Michigan. After that are the Forest County Potawatomi over in Wisconsin the Prairie Band Potawatomi, which is the first place that they were removed to. They continued on from there to the Citizen Band, Shishibanyuk Potawatomi. We came across, so we go across to Detroit, that's where we started, and right across from Detroit is Wapo Island. Up from Hanneville, sorry, Wapo Island Indian community, up near Hanneville is Wikwemikong, and Batchewana is over by Ontario all around these Great Lakes are our Potawatomi people, keeping those places safe. Um, and this is a, just a little bit of history of some of our elders and going to look at some of those treaties down a couple years ago. Boarding school error. Boarding school error is going to, we're going to go through it fast because we don't have a lot of time. And it's really ugly. 1879, uh, Carlisle Indian School was modeled after military prisons. Carlisle Indian School wasn't the first Indian boarding school, though. Riverside was in Anadarko. Riverside still exists today, and it was established in, like, 1871. But the first three official Indian schools that were established were modeled after successful Indian prisons from the Indian Wars that we just talked about were happening in the 100 years prior to this. So Genoa Indian School in Nebraska, Haskell Indian School in Kansas, Fort Sill in Oklahoma. Haskell is an Indian Nations University now. Genoa closed almost immediately, and Fort Sill still exists today and is also um, juvenile. Uh, what was a juvenile detention center? Boarding school era, our kids are forcibly removed and put into military prison camps for Indian children for generations. The intention was to get the Indian out of the children, removing them from their families, their food, their, their food systems would cause a lack of tribal knowledge and that knowledge to be forgotten. Our families went to great strides to get their kids back. At Haskell Indian Nations University, the gallows are still there for all of those students to go see for, that were there for the intention of the parents who would not stop relentlessly trying to get their kids. That's not in the official report, 
but you can go see those. This is Yang Dun Su, boy, pretty rock. At 13 years old, he was the first boy of his tribe to be college educated. He got sent off to be college educated. We weren't granted citizenship until 1924. We didn't have the rights of Americans until until my grandparents were young kids. That's Pretty Rock, but that's not Pretty Rock, that's Felix Bruno. What's the point of that first picture? So, the systemic, right, the intention, racism. A lot can be written off as, um, that's just the circumstance, what the circumstances led to. It's not what the circumstances led to. So there was an investigation of un-American propaganda. Boarding schools fall into un-American propaganda. Personally, I'm definitely opposed to the policy of using academic school time to give instructions in Indian languages, arts and crafts, music and dancing to the exclusion of other courses and similar subjects which are included in the public school curriculum. No such effort is made on behalf of any of the many races or nationalities that make up the American population. It's in past years, silly sentimentalists have historically denounced the government because children attending the government schools were forbidden to speak their native language. This was intentional, this was systemic, this was not a result of circumstances. Deb Halland is our Secretary of Interior. Had we not had the very first Native American woman elected to the cabinet, but also to the Secretary of Interior, because you know what she's responsible for? The Secretary of Interior is responsible for all of our parks, all of our federal lands, and the management of the Indian nations. Why human management is included in that, I wouldn't know. And so, Truth and Reconciliation happened to First Nations people, which started the domino effect of being able to uncover these things here in Michigan, in the, in the United States. I'm sorry, not Michigan, in the United States. So Truth and Reconciliation in First Nations over in Canada, they were all done. Everyone gave their testimony. The courts deemed that they had won, they deserved restitution, and they were willing to pay that, but every one of those survivors had to get up and retell their story in front of the court before they could get their, their payments. Okay, so that was start, like I said, those, those things had started off up there already and been established. Kill the Indian, save the man. William Pratt said that in 18, 70-ish, um, about when these schools started being created. They were his idea, he was a military man, um, he was the one who was successful in the military prison camps and created this. So in Michigan, in 1893, Mount Pleasant Industrial Boarding School was created. And this is where all of our Pokagon and St. Joe band of Indian kids got taken right out of this Berrien Springs area. They would just come into our houses. They knew where our houses were. They knew where we lived. They would know how many kids they ha we had, and they would come back. They would keep coming back. The kids would either die or be taken off to school, one or the other. Those were the only options. Holy Childhood was about the same time. All boarding schools were supposed to close. The funding for them was eliminated in the 20s and they were supposed to close by the 60s. Holy Childhood didn't close until 1986. Those are people my age who live in that community. There are nuns from Holy Childhood who are still alive, who live in the communities, and generations of Indian people and Indian families have to see these crimes go unpunished, unrecognized, and they just have to live with the knowledge within their families that these crimes against our people don't exist. Um, we just got a couple of minutes here, so I'm gonna go through the last of these. Uh, the Constitution recognizes us as individually governed nations. Uh, an Indian treaty is no different than every single treaty that was being created between the United States or any other country and any other nations in the world. When we were creating treaties, they were creating treaties other in other countries. 
the same treaties. Indian Treaty is a misnomer. Uh, the Trade and Intercourse Act is what gave us the ability to be able to allow post-trader error Removal Act, these are just things you guys can all look up. But I'm here today because the Reorganization Act said that as Pokagon people, we could come back into our homeland if we could prove we still existed, we still had our ways, and we still had land base. We weren't able to do that until 1994. In 1994, when we did that, it was illegal in Dwajak for more than three unrelated Indian people to be gathered in public. It was the very first thing that we did when we got recognized in 1994, when Bill Clinton recognized us, our tribal council, their first order of business was to have that law changed. This is some of, some of the battles that we had to fight. Our, our hall of records was burnt down, but this is not uh, an isolated story. I really don't know if I know any tribes who haven't had their records in their halls of records burnt. We're still fighting for federal recognition. Uh, a little bit of that I just went through, but, uh, but, I, but I want to say, in all of my research and in all of, in all, all of this knowledge that I have, there is nothing that protects my people from being removed again. And these are our Pokagon kids today. Well, in 2013, these are some of our Pokagon kids. These are language speakers now, culture bearers, all of them in some way, shape, or form. Allyship. Real quick, let's talk about allyship. You can share your records. Sharing your records is something that I learned when I did a nun symposium with the Adrian Dominican sisters a couple months ago. And the Downriver, um, the Monroe nuns. And what I learned there was that you guys all have records that we don't know about and that we haven't seen. And that as a religious entity, the greatest thing that they could do for allyship was release all their records and that's where they were on that. Releasing your records. Promoting accurate resources. Uh, you guys have done a really fabulous job of that today, bringing us in to have these hard conversations. And that's true allyship, sharing these resources, sharing good, quantifiable things that you know people will listen to um, is really how you can be an ally, because that's a question I get at all of these, allyship and how can we contribute. There's a couple of links up there that might help you. Some of our language, um, it's been a long history of fighting for existence, which is why we came here today to share with you. And I'm being told to wrap it up. I think we're good. And miigwech for having us here today. Uh, St. Andrews University. We put our hands together again for Madeline. Thank you so much. Just before we close, and this should be put on the screen uh, here in a moment, uh, I'd like to read to you all uh, for the first time uh, Andrews University's official land acknowledgement statement. It is extremely important that we recognize and acknowledge that our Berrien Springs campus sits on land that was part of a larger area here in Michigan and elsewhere that was seized from land owned by the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi tribe. As is stated on the Potawatomi website, each indigenous nation has its own creation story. This land seizure was driven by the 1833 Treaty of Chicago which established the conditions for the removal of the Potawatomi from the Great Lakes area. When Michigan became a state in 1837, more pressure was put on the Potawatomi to move west. The hazardous trip killed one out of every 10 people of the approximately 500 Potawatomi involved. As news of the terrible trip spread, some bands consisting of small groups of families fled to northern Michigan and Canada. Some also tried to take refuge in the forests and swamps of southwestern Michigan. The U.S. government sent soldiers to round up any of the Potawatomi they could find and would then move them at gunpoint to reservations in the west. This forced removal, as we learn today, is now called the Potawatomi Trail of Death. 
similar to the more familiar Cherokee Trail of Tears. However, a small group of Nishnabek, meaning original or true people, with Leopold Polkagin as one of their leaders, earned the right to remain in their original homeland, in part because they had demonstrated a strong attachment to Catholicism. It is the descendants of that small group who constitute the Pokagan Band of Potawatomi, who we learned from today. This was a sad extension of the deeply harmful effects of what has become known as the Doctrine of Discovery, which established a spiritual, political, and legal justification for colonization and seizure of land not inhabited by Christians. And this will be available on our website and you'll be able to learn more by clicking there. We thank you for your presence today. We hope that this is not the beginning of your learning journey here. We're gonna provide more opportunities for that. We're grateful for the presence of our local tribe and we look forward to continuing to partner with them. Uh, and thank you so much. And we will see you uh, next week at Pioneer Memorial Church. God bless you.